the Ismaili tariqa of Islam has the same pillars as other Muslims. Uh, there are some differences in forms, and we've talked about forms already. The other thing to remember is that because this is a tariqa of Islam, these pillars have additional dimensions to them that members of the tariqa participate in. So, for example, the shahada is pretty straightforward. The Ismailis have the same shahada, right? Like many other Shias, there's a third shahada that's added, and in the case of the Ismaili Muslims, they recite Ashadan Aliyun Amir al Mu'minin Aliullah, which means, you know, I bear witness that Ali, the commander of the faithful, is the exalted of God. Other than that, it's the same shahada. But then, because there's this notion of the esoteric, the shahada has an inner dimension. The inner dimension of the shahada in Shia Ismaili Islam is walaya. And walaya here means love, devotion, and allegiance to God, the Prophet, and the Imam. So from this perspective, it's not, it's not enough just to witness. The deeper meaning of shahada is to cultivate this inner sense of love. Right? Uh, the next pillar is prayer or salat. Now, in the Ismaili tariqa, the form of salat is different from the namaz that is performed by most other Muslims. Okay? In the Ismaili tariqa, the form of salat is a prayer that is recited three times per day. Okay? And, and I'm not saying that there's five prayers done at three times. This prayer is recited only three times per day. Right? And this prayer, it, it's an Arabic prayer, and it's called the Dua, with the capital D. Right? It's a prayer that only members of the Ismaili Tariqa would perform. Uh, this Dua contains six cycles or parts, sort of comparable to a rakat, And it includes, it starts with verses from the Quran, beginning with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. It contains some, some uh, verses about the glorification of God. It contains a supplication. And it ends with prostration. Right? It's, an, it's a prayer in Arabic. In many ways, it's very similar in its structure to the namaz. It's not the same thing, but there are many similarities. And at the end of the dua, so after an Ismaili Muslim recites his dua, he will also recite all the names of the 49 imams. That is a lot to memorize. Right? Especially, you know, young children. So they begin the list with you know, Imam Ali, and it continues all the way to Imam Shakri Imam Hosseini, right? So, moving forward, um, in Shia Ismaili Islam, purity is also a pillar, right? And there's the notion of the exoteric purity, which is the purity of the body, which, you know, are common in, in Sunni Islam. And there's also the notion of esoteric purity. So there's the idea that and one of the Ismaili Imams said this, the esoteric ablution is washing in truth which is necessary for the soul. So just as the body needs to be washed, the soul needs to be washed. Then there's the pillar of zakat, which also includes kums. Now once again, the Quran doesn't tell you what zakat is, how it's paid. So in Shia Ismaili Islam, the zakat and kums is actually one-tenth of one's income. It's given, one-tenth of one's income is given to the Imam. The Imam serves as the custodian of those funds, and he channels it to these various development projects, which end up benefiting the poor. Uh, then there's the pillar of fasting. And once again, you have the Ramadan fasting, which we're all familiar with. But then you also have this other kind of fasting. There's the notion of esoteric fasting, where one abstains from everything that is bad for 12 months a year. And it's this idea that, and one of the Ismaili Imams says, that one should keep your inner self fasting for as long as you live. Right? So the pillars have these dual requirements upon a murid of an Ismaili tariqa. And uh, the final pillar, and we'll talk about Hajj today, but same thing. So you have the notion of exoteric pilgrimage to visit the Kaaba. And then in Shia Ismaili Islam, you have this notion of esoteric pilgrimage. The esoteric pilgrimage is to have an audience with the Imam of the time. Right? So Hajj has that dual dimension as well. And it is a very, very significant thing in the life of an Ismaili Muslim to have an audience with the Imam. 
right? It is very, very important. Uh, the Prophet's farewell pilgrimage was very, very important. Why? Because Muhammad was among his followers, right? And there's many blessings that accrue from being in the presence of the Prophet. So the same thing applies in the case of the Imam for the Ismailis. And thus, the Kaaba, which is the physical house of God in Mecca, is understood to be a symbol for the living Imam himself. There's a correspondence between the Kaaba and the Imam, as Professor Shafiq Virani writes in his book. The Imam is the one symbolized by the Kaaba. While the Kaaba is the physical house of God, the Imam is his living reality. And I guess the best way to, to underscore what this means is in 1996, in 1996, the Imam visited Tajikistan. And this was the first time in a thousand years that an Ismaili Imam visited that region. And here's a little picture of the scene that was there, where the Imam literally walks, um, literally walks amongst the Ismaili Muslims. So it was a very, very jubilant time. And I'm saying this because in a couple of years, the Aga Khan will visit Toronto, and all the Ismailis will be very, very happy, and everybody will be celebrating that the Imam is coming, and perhaps now we'll better be able to understand what all the hype is all about. So